All right, morning, everyone. Uh, let's get let's get started. Uh, while a few more people will uh, will join us. Uh, welcome to the next installment of the JKMRC Friday morning seminar series that take place at the Indoor Pili Lecture Theater and online. My name is Katarina and myself and Karina are the co-chairs uh, of the seminar series, organizing them and taking turns introducing the speakers this year. On behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge all traditional owners and their custodianship of the lens on which we all meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize our valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Our speaker today is Karen Jane. Karen is currently employed as an environmental engineer and geochemist at the Mine Waste Management or MWM consultancy. While he is, well, no, I learned he already finished his PhD, uh, PhD research at SMI here at the University of Queensland under the supervision of Mansoor Adraki and Neil McIntyre on environmental hydrogeochemistry of mine waste. So throughout his PhD and uh, professional work experience, Karen has been involved in understanding the salinity generation and release dynamics from Queensland coal mine spoils. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from India and master of science degree in environmental pollution control from the Pennsylvania State University in the US. His current areas of interest are in providing geochemical and environmental support for mineral resources industry. Today's presentation is titled Prediction of Long-Term Soil Generation from Coal Mine Spoils. Please let's welcome Kara. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, so I'd just like to acknowledge people who I've worked with uh, on this project, uh, Neil McIntyre, Mansoor Edraki, and Melinda Hilton, who were a part of the ACAR project uh, on salinity. And also like to thank coal industry partners for their help in assisting with the leaching experiments. And a special thanks goes to Thomas Bromgardel, Mandana, and Vinod Nath for their assistance with the project. Um, so before I talk about this project, I just wanted to uh, go through what is spoil. So spoil is the overburden material that is removed from an open cut coal mining operation in order to reveal the coal seam. Uh, so on this photo, you would you would be able to see uh, once the topsoil is removed uh, in an open cut coal mine uh, and the 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 uh, land is blasted, all the waste, uh, waste rocks, which is known as overburden, is removed in order to access the coal seam. So, which is, be, which is dumped usually in and around uh, designated emplacement areas on the mine site. And these are known as spoil piles. So, the focus of the project was uh, Bowen Basin. So, on the, uh, the figure on the right shows the map of Bowen Basin. And uh, as you can see in that figure, different colors, red, blue, and green, are the dominant host for coal seams. Uh, this is uh, the dominant host are Wrangell coal measures, Moran, uh, uh, Morenba coal measures, and German Creek coal measures. Uh, the annual mean annual rainfall in Bowen Basin uh, is around 640 to 750 millimeters per annum. And uh, it's the rainfall is somewhere dominant. That is, seventy-five percent occurs between October to March, uh, often as storms. And annual uh, potential evaporation rates for Bowen Basin is around uh, eighteen hundred to uh, two thousand millimeters. Uh, so evaporation is way too high than precipitation uh, at Bowen Basin. And then there are significant droughts uh, with. Uh, minimum annual rainfall around 300, uh, 100 to 300 millimeters. Uh, and sometimes you get maximum uh, rainfall to be uh, 1100 to uh, 1600 millimeters, which we might see since last three years due to the La Nina uh, weather pattern that's bringing a lot of thunderstorms and rain throughout central Queensland, uh, throughout Queensland, East Coast and central Queensland. So there are occasional extremely wet events uh, from large rain depressions and uh, cyclones. 
Uh, the figure in the middle uh, is also uh, showing a stratigraphy of Bowen Basin. So as you can see uh, from the figure, Wrangell coal measures is on the top uh, of the Permian uh, formation. And then uh, Morenbach coal measures and German Creek coal measures, yellow and green color uh, are, uh, are, are at the bottom and then they are uh, uh, overlaying each other. Uh, so this is the domin these are the three dominant hosts where most of the coal seams are uh, within Bowen Basin. So uh, just to give you an overview of spoil production process. So when you start uh, mining, uh, what happens is you uh, you blast the material and then drag lines would move the materials uh, uh, and start dumping them around the mine site. So that's the beginning of the mine. As the mining continues, uh, you get more and more uh, spoil uh, production. And towards the end of the mining, what would end up is uh, uh, spoil piles around the mine sites and spoil piles dumped in the pit. Uh, and there and, and and there would be a final pond, uh, final void uh, after the end of mining. So this that's how that's the scale of the spoil piles uh, compared to what it was at the beginning of mining. And now touching base on mine drainage characteristics. So in relation uh, to drainage pH, uh, this is a pretty handy uh, diagram showing what kind of drainage could you expect. Uh, depending on the pH conditions. Uh, there are three types. First is acid rock drainage, which is acidic conditions where pH is acidic. Um, and due to pH being acidic, there are elevated metals within that drainage and elevated sulfate. And you might need to treat them for acid neutralization and metal and sulfate removal. And then there's another uh, type of drainage, neutral mine drainage, uh, which is where the pH neutral to alkaline, there would be low to moderate metals, such as cadmium, zinc, arsenic, selenium, and there would be low to moderate sulfate. Um, it's often treated for metals and sometimes removal of sulfates. And then there's saline drainage that would have pH from uh, acidic to alkaline. Uh, there would be low metals, but a moderate uh, Fe ion and moderate sulfate uh, would require treatment for sulfate and sometimes metal removal. So on this uh, project, we'll be focusing more on neutral mine drainage and saline mine drainage uh, towards the right-hand side of the plot. Sorry. So this is, uh, so we went, uh, as a part of this project, we went on a couple of mine sites, different miners, and uh, we did some site visits. And this is a photograph of a uh, final void. Uh, and, uh, and that's after uh, the mining was uh, done uh, on this void. And just give you a perspective of what spoil dumps are. This is the landscape uh, on an active mine where you see this spoil piles. It's enormous and spread it throughout Bowen Basin. Uh, this is also one of, taken from a rehabilitated spoil dump. Uh, the photo was taken from the spoil dump and then is overseeing another fresh dumped spoils uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the extreme end. And then uh, seepage of saline water uh, can be from rehabilitated spoils like this, as well as uh, un un untreated or not rehabilitated spoils. So uh, as a part of our field trips, uh, what we did is we also took some water site water quality data. Uh, if we were lucky and there was rainfall, uh, um, before our field trips, we had some sampling done, and the pH would uh, was from those seepage sums was from seven point five to eight, and EC was from six to fifteen millisiemens per centimeter. And on the figure on the left, this, this the white color stuff is is you see is the surface surface salt crust uh, that uh, that that ends up when the water uh, dried out uh, due to high evaporation rates. So uh, this is really a good photo uh, I've kept in here just to highlight that spoils are very heterogeneous materials. Uh, for example, it would, it would be from clay size to boulders, 
uh, and then that would result in uh, preferential flow paths inside the spoil piles. Uh, we don't know much about the distribution of water tables and the moisture within these spoil dumps, but uh, we're hoping with geophysics and tracers, we can get an understanding of that uh, moisture and water table within those dumps because drilling is very expensive and it's not feasible uh, for all the operations. So uh, geophysics and tracers uh, are something um, that can help. But what we know for, uh, within this dump is there's three different zones. Uh, the top zone is controlled by evaporation processes. The middle zone is usually unsaturated, but would have burst water tables, depending on the material types. And the bottom zone is, uh, is saturated and would have interactions with water groundwater table. So that's our current understanding of the uh, moisture conditions and hydrology within the spoil piles. Um, now, talking about the sources of salinity in mining contexts, where are the salts coming from? Uh, they might be coming from pyrite oxidation and as a dissolution of carbonates, that's as AMD processes, or they might be coming from the precip precipitation and dissolution of secondary minerals and efflorescent salts, such as hydrosulfates and epsomite, or they might be originating from sedimentary origins, uh, uh, such as evaporite deposits, uh, chloride, sulfate, phosphate minerals, or elevated concentrations of alkali and halogen elements. So just giving you a background, for the salt leaching process, <clears throat> from geochemical perspective, the sources of salts, the figure on the A, uh, uh, that can be geogenic. That means that might be coming from sedimentary environment. Uh, and in, 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 in some cases uh, where you have pyrite, it, the pyrite would oxidize and it would dissolve the carbonates and you might have salts leaching out or uh, it might also be coming from dissolution of silicate, uh, the minerals such as muscovite and chloride, which are, um, which are uh, uh, soluble compared to the other silicate minerals, uh, or it might be coming from the ion exchange with clay minerals. So this is uh, our understanding uh, from a uh, geo geochemical perspective. However, hydrology also plays an important role in the salt leaching process. The figure B you see on the right, where uh, where you can see uh, we have this hydrological processes in terms of preferential flow paths known as macropores. And then we have uh, micropores, uh, uh, which, uh, which is the movement of uh, solutes between intra and interparticle diffused through in, uh, diffusion. And then it also ends up to the preferential flow paths, which carries the solutes out, of, out as a leachate and seepages. So geochemical and hydrological processes go hand by hand uh, together. Um, and uh, knowing about all this, um, uh, we need to ask ourselves some fundamental questions uh, to rehabilitate spoils and also to uh, close final voids and manage them for closure. Uh, so questions we're dealing here are like, how do we predict salt release rates from spoil piles? What laboratory procedures are more appropriate? Is spoil salinity related to acid and metalliferous drainage, AMD processes? Uh, can we develop numerical models to predict salt release? And can we scale up our prediction? So these were the fundamental questions that our project was looking at addressing. And I'll go through each questions in the next set of slides, uh, step by step. Um, before I head up, I'll just introduce you to uh, the modeling uh, modeling of the leach rates. Uh, so this is a simple release uh, dynamic model system where the parameters include dissolution and diffusion constants. Um, so the, the, the important thing in here uh, is the, the light blue color uh, on the top is preferential flow path and uh, the gray one is the spoil material and the other blue color besides the gray color is the micropores and that's where the diffusion occurs. So this was a simple model uh, that was uh, from a paper that was focusing on AMD processes, but it's equally applicable to salt release processes. So what this tells us is um, <clears throat> uh, through our experiments, empirical work, 
uh, we can uh, understand this complex processes through modeling of the leach rates, which includes minimum parameters. Uh, for example, uh, dissolution kinetic constant and then diffusion kin kinetic constants. So modeling of the uh, so the, the the central idea of this slide is that we can model the, the leach rates uh, with very minimum parameters. Uh, uh, you can see from uh, from from different constants, kinetic constants, diffusion constants, and then uh, kinetic reactions. Um, also, I'll touch base on uh, on 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 one of the. Uh, quasi steady state definitions which you'll come across in next of the slides so uh, what 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 we're looking at is uh, if you look at the salt load throughout mining uh, uh, let's start with active mining when you're uh, building up your spoil piles dumping everything uh, throughout uh, operations so there might be a disturbance uh, and salt load that's a function of uh, flux times concentration would be very high during that time and then once and there's an end of mining uh, and end of dump construction, uh, it would slowly uh, it, it would slowly decline with time uh, the salt load. And then what we want to do is we want to understand what time would the salt flux would achieve an equilibrium condition. So that's known as quasi steady state conditions, which means there's a constant release rates with a superimposed climate and subsidence uh, related variations. So that's what we want to understand what how much time would this take to have the flow rates uh, salt load to achieve these conditions and uh, just hitting up from a scale perspective uh, the approach of our project was first uh, we try to understand the mineralogy of the of the of the materials uh, that are being dumped and then the uh, the standard procedure is that we conduct a static test uh, to understand uh, such as acid base accounting just to understand the chemical properties of that material and then uh, we move into a kinetic test uh, which can give us some leach rates uh, and get an understanding of how the materials would behave under different moisture uh, conditions uh, and then uh, the idea is to uh, move on to a, a field scale conditions uh, through scaling so that's a general uh, approach to the project and i'll hit up uh, the sample classification so in order to uh, in order to be consistent with geological classification, our project differentiated all the samples uh, based on uh, rock-like and soil-like materials. So, soil-like materials are the materials where you have very finer sections of materials, and it's a matrix-supported matrix, -supported matrix uh, very fine materials, uh, whereas. Uh, uh, rock likes are category three and four, which are framework supported, bigger, coarser materials, and uh, compared to uh, the finer ones. So that's uh, that's how we differentiated materials: rock like and soil like. And we uh, out of the uh, big uh, batches of sample that we selected from site, we narrowed it narrowed it down to nine different sam uh, samples from five different mine sites: A, B, C, D, and E. And we had different types of uh, materials, sandstones, uh, weathered sandstones, uh, mud rock, <clears throat> and tertiary spoil. Uh, <clears throat> you can see we selected Wrangell uh, coal measures, and then one of the spoil was selected from Moranba coal measures. So we did select a diverse range of uh, samples based on their properties and what we wanted to look at. Uh, uh, we started with initial characterization. So we uh, wanted to understand the mineralogy and the, uh, typically rocks are mud rock, that is siltstones and mudstones, and then there are sandstones. So in, the, in this figure, you can see figure A, uh, this is where the salts are released from clay minerals. This is, it's a mud rock, and this is where the salts are released, ion exchange done from these clay minerals. Whereas if you're looking at a sandstone, which is fine to medium grained, uh, which has an abundant of orthogenic minerals, uh, uh, it, it can release a lot of salts through its surfaces. And then figure C is an example of uh, pyrite uh, under a frame, uh, under a uh, reflected light, you can see. So pyrite oxidation can also uh, release salts. Uh, so uh, 
initial characterization is very important uh, uh, as a part of waste characterization just to get an understanding of what minerals are there on the materials and how would they behave under leaching conditions. Uh, next step was uh, as a part of initial characterization was to perform degradation tests. So degradation tests. So it's it's uh, we wanted to just get an understanding of like salt release is a chemical process, but it's also a physical process. So this degradation test was carried out. Uh, if you see uh, the spoils uh, cycle one on the extreme left, uh, what we did is we took the biggest uh, spoil uh, uh, spoils uh, rocks and then we kept into into a container, one liter container. We added water to the container and then we allowed the water to be there for uh, sitting there for 28 days and on the 29th day, we would discard the water off, measure ECPH and then we would do same until the, there's a degradation of rock and we monitored the degradation of rock and you can see some rocks are very good uh, at uh, good uh, good at uh, 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 highly resistance to weathering, whereas some would just turn into very fine materials. Um, for example, C1, D1, and E2, the bottom three, have just disintegrated after three cycles uh, compared to A2 and A10 on the top where the rocks are still intact even after 17 cycles, 17 months of sitting in water. So th this tells us how uh, uh, the breakdown uh, is important and how that would affect salt leaching. Um, so that was also part of our degradation. And then we moved on to um, kinetic experiments. So we designed some column, le column leaching experiments customized to uh, understanding of salt release. Uh, traditional approach is based on AMD. Uh, and um, uh, usually uh, you know, funnel leaching experiments are uh, being uh, carried out by industry as a standard practice to understand the kinetic behavior of the materials. Uh, but we wanted to try, uh, uh, and we wanted to get an understanding of moisture regime, how moisture would impact salt leaching. And so what we did is we tried four different uh, re uh, spoils. And then we also experimented four different wetting regimes. That is, we, have, we were wetting some uh, one set of sample biweekly, one set of sample weekly, one set of sample fortnightly, and once, uh, one we just kept it saturated throughout. And we were monitoring the EC, pH, and all other major uh, ions. Uh, and we did this for 34 cycles. Uh, so imagine leaching them for fortnightly would end up to 68 weeks. So uh, more than a year of uh, leaching. <clears throat> and, uh, and in total, 16 columns were built uh, for this setup. Uh, and I'll go through the results of EC in the next slide. So um, four different spoils, A2, B8, A10, and B9. Um, what we found out is the electrical conductivity release pattern in all the four spoils were similar in regards to, we saw phase one release, phase two, and phase three. So phase one was, uh, was the release pattern wherein you have release of the soluble salts that's already sitting on the rock surfaces and uh, uh, is also known as first, first flush. Uh, and then you have the steady decline as phase two, and then you kind of uh, have a steady, quasi steady conditions developed within the phase three. So what we've done is uh, we have calculated the decay values at each stages uh, throughout um, uh, the leaching process, and we know how salts would decay at, uh, at, per, at, at what phases. So I'll talk about that in my later slides, but that was an important understanding on how the salts would leach out. Um, and then uh, this process is also de uh, dependent on lithology and uh, mineralogy of spoil. Uh, for example, uh, if we compare two different spoils, A10 and A2, uh, on the, the top one, A10, uh, if you see the top left figure, uh, the, it's a, it shows a good dissolution of sodium chloride. Uh, one is to one, close to one is to one. Uh, uh, and, and even on the, on the top right part, uh, the dissolution of gypsum, because you can see calcium and uh, calcium magnesium versus sulfate and bicarbonate still getting a trend. Uh, but for A2, the bottom two uh, figures, uh, which, which had pyrite, for the same amount of calcium, you have uh, more sulfate that is being released due to the oxidation of pyrite. Uh, and 
the oxidation of pyrite brings down the pH. And as a result of that, you get the dissolution of sodium from minerals like sodium plagio plagioclase. Uh, so uh, what, what I want to say is like the initial mineralogy is important, but the effect of pyrite is also important in the release of salts. <clears throat> and then we thought, why don't we just test this, uh, uh, the effects of pyrite? So what we did is uh, we had this A2 material, which had pyrite, uh, and then we trial different regimes. Uh, and then we came up the, with a new set of experiment, we, the figure you see in the middle, where we purged nitrogen gas within that PVC column. Uh, and then we constantly purged it uh, with nitrogen so that we wanted to create anoxic conditions, no oxygen conditions. So as less oxygen as practical, uh, and, 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 and the figure on the right shows you the cumulative sulfate loading uh, on different moisture regime. Uh, so what we found out is like if you, uh, if you have a fortnightly regime, so you just wet your materials every fortnight and allow it to dry, it's going to end up releasing more sulfate uh, compared to you keep it saturated and then you purge it with nitrogen, create completely anoxic conditions. So that was uh, one of the learnings that uh, pyrite oxidation does impact uh, the salt release from spoil. But, uh, but this is not all about AMD. Uh, if you plot the leachates in a Piper diagram, the ternary diagram, uh, the cluster changes from sample to sample. So majority of salts are geogenic, but where pyrite is, there, there is a chance that it would contribute to the release of salts. So uh, just for some understandings from our column leaching experiments that the release of salts depends on pre-dumping state of spoils. Uh, initial mineralogy and geogenic salt contents are important. The oxidation of pyrite, even at very low concentrations, would also impact your salt release. And then the duration of water rock interaction that is saturated in fortnightly leaching cycles released higher amounts of salts compared to the other regimes. Most spoils released saline leachates early and reached quasi steady state at 10 to 12 cycles with no significant change at the end of experimented cycle, the 34 cycles. So this is important when you want to uh, try kinetic leaching experiments. Uh, and it might not be necessary to run your columns for a longer time. 10 to 12 cycles would be enough. That's what our experiment uh, 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 said. Uh, and initial EC mineralogy and total salt contents and degradation tests can complement column leaching results, but cannot be used as proxies. So that were our findings from column leaching experiments. and then. Um, what we decided is we want to uh, scale up and try a bigger scale. So what we did is we went to the mine sites, collected the samples uh, on, as you can see, those IB, uh, the bottom right figure, uh, the IBCs, the boxes uh, are can, uh, can accommodate one, one and a half ton of material. Uh, and the, the, we, we, we kind of went to the site and then filled up those uh, fresh materials from an active mining area and then transported it back to the UQ Pinjara Hills facility. That's where we have set up the leaching experiments uh, from different uh, spoil uh, types. And then the figure on the top right, you can see different locations where the spoil originated and then were sampled. So that's what we did uh, in order to scale up. So the idea was, just to try to mimic what is what is happening in the field and to understand the spoil field conditions, uh, which uh, the figure on the right shows. There was a uh, this is our current understanding where you got this upper zone uh, that is evapor transpiration, then you got this unsaturated zone, and the bottom zone is saturated. So we just wanted to mimic that, and we wanted to move close to the field condition. So that's what we did as a part of that experiment. We also had an opportunity to put sensors in at two different depths, so five, uh, five, five centimeters from the top, and then we had another at uh, 0 0.7 meters from the top uh, uh, of the IBC. So that's, uh, that's the figures on the left are our materials. You could see it's a very diverse range of materials uh, from different mine sites that we did. And then 
just an example of B8 and B9. So B9 uh, is a soil-like material and B8 is a rock-like material. So it has gone through three years of leaching. So it's like after three years, it's really good to see how uh, it's developing the quasi steady conditions uh, 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 from, uh, from say, 1200 cumulative uh, at 1200 cumulative outflow liters. Uh, and in, in the case of rock, like after 2000 uh, to uh, around 3000 uh, outflow liters. So it's really good to see. And this is what we wanted so that we could feed this into our models, which I'll be talking about in my next slides. Um, another uh, set of experiments. So, so, so uh, I'll just go back to this one quickly. So this was wet dry cycles. So wet dry cycles means we are trying to replicate the same conditions, uh, what's happening in field. But what we did is we filled up the IBCs completely with water and then allowed them to completely dry before adding the water again. Uh, whereas uh, rainfall simulator was uh, used to just mimic the field rainfall rates. And then uh, we, uh, we drained them uh, uh, as standard uh, annual rainfall, what would we see in Moranba, uh, uh, central Queensland? And that's what we mimicked here uh, as uh, E1 and B7, both are rock-like spoils. And what, what you see is we still get to see the same trend that we saw in uh, lab experiments columns. But the things get complicated when you have soil-like samples, uh, C1 and D1, like you can see from the photos on the left, D1, it's completely soil-like samples. And then C1, it's very fine. Both samples are very fine. So that's an issue. In order to predict the electrical conductivity, you can see the trends are going up with time. Um, so I, that's through due to the degradation of material to such an extent that it's uh, holding salts within its uh, within within its uh, 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 within IBC, and then uh, whenever uh, preferential flow path is um, uh, or, or uh, whenever the material is degrading, and then there are opening and closing of new preferential flow paths, we get to see a lot of a uh, spike in EC. So that's what we saw from soil like spoils, and this might be exactly what would happen in a real spoil pile uh, out on the mine sites. So this was an understanding that materials would behave different based on their properties, rock-like and uh, soil-like, uh, based on their mineralogy, clay fractions, and how would they uh, swell, uh, degrade, and disintegrate. Uh, so this was another, just going up to the C1 again, uh, the top it's the same as, as the same plot that we saw earlier EC. Just wanted to highlight this, that we also had soil moisture sensors. And what we found out from this was uh, higher moisture uh, resulted in lower salinity and lower moisture resulted in higher salinity. And that's understandable due to uh, dilution. Uh, but this was not apparent in rock-like samples. Uh, so indicate, uh, I mean, uh, so, it's it's really uh, it's it was really helpful to get an understanding of the internal in situ moisture conditions uh, and understand what was happening within the soil like materials. So uh, just finding up the scale up leaching experiments, what we found out was mesocosm uh, release salts at a lower rate compared to columns, which are more similar to what we see in the real spoil piles. Under wet, dry, or saturated conditions, similar to what we see in lab experiments, column leaching, samples lost a greater amount of salts, particularly in initial leaching cycles. When samples were leached at rainfall rates close to the field conditions, the release of salts was steady or even increasing for the duration of experiments. So that's also important that uh, it might not, uh, your lab experiments might not uh, are, the, uh, are, are, are triggered uh, to, uh, so the conditions are triggered so that everything leaches out really quickly, whereas you might not see them uh, uh, in field. And the unsaturated IBC, IBCs showed that infiltrating saline water may not appear at the base of spoil piles as sea pages and piles and spoils may even become non-conductive to infiltration. Uh, and overall, it is intuitive that medium scale experiments are close to field conditions with respect to spoil salinity predictions. So um, that, was, that was our understanding at mesoscale. And then now we have column experimental data. We have mesoscale experimental data. What we did was uh, just giving an example of spoil B8 
we compared the initial stage decay and late stage decay. So, so the initial stage decay is uh, something that is uh, the, the, the rate of uh, individual ion that are being decayed for initial cycles of salt uh, leaching. Whereas the late stage is the last three cycles of that particular uh, spoil uh, leaching experiment. So we calculated it for uh, all the major ions, sodium, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sulfate, and uh, across IBC scale and column scale across different uh, regimes. So uh, this, this is an indication of uh, how things change going from column to mesoscale. Uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's what, what we want to do is that we want to um, validate this decay values that we are seeing from these experiments uh, through some field trials. So uh, uh, this is just an example of like how different it is from initial stage to uh, late stage decay. So that's what we got out of our experiments uh, for all the materials. And then this, uh, this uh, the idea was that to use this for modeling. So I'll quickly jump onto the modeling uh, part of our project. So uh, the next step, as I said, was uh, to develop a simple numerical model using kinetic parameters. So uh, fast and slow processes. Um, so for example, uh, this, this is a simple mass flow model. Uh, it's not a mechanistic model such as um, hydrous. Uh, so uh, this 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 tells us how much salt will release over time from column and IBCs, uh, uh, taking into account slow processes that is uh, coupled with weathering and diffusion of salts and fast processes K2, resolution of salts exposed to the flow. Uh, and then uh, the modeling is based on the change of mass or time and as a function of flow rate uh, and, 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 and the slow and fast processes. So uh, this, is, this, this is what we used to model. And uh, uh, my supervisor, Neil uh, McIntyre, uh, 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 had, uh, had calibrated these models and found a good match with our experimental data and the numerical models that he developed. So he also uh, used rainfall data uh, uh, and extrapolated this, uh, uh, but we haven't validated this yet. Uh, and there is some degree of uncertainty, but there's still some predictive capacity to be able to extrapolate this to field conditions. So the next uh, next is to get into the field and validate these models uh, by monitoring real size field conditions. And this uh, this this was really good uh, uh, good to get a good match between the observed and model values across different moisture regimes and across different scales, column scale and IBC scale. So that's that's how our uh, modeling. Uh, 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 data uh, concluded, and then uh, uh, practical implications of this work uh, was that the salt decay parameters, which uh, expresses leaching rates in units gram per kilogram per meter group, that is decay per meter of drainage, are potentially more transferable to real spoil dumps. The strong dependence of K values on flow and moisture conditions encourages the salt decay parameters to be integrated into a spoil dump hydrological models and the need to characterize spoil dump internal structure and hydrology, uh, especially the degree of heterogeneity in flow and moisture conditions and how this relates to geochemical properties. So that's the, one of the practical implications. Um, the second uh, simple quasi steady leach rate models superimposed on spoil hydrology models, which sufficiently represents the flow and moisture distribution in the spoil pile can be used to provide estimates of long-term salt loads to the environment after appropriate spoil characterization and scale factor application. And lastly, uh, mesoscales test uh, more uh, realistic and are close to field conditions and is a way forward for industry to monitor salinity uh, from spoils on mine sites. So with that, uh, we uh, have, uh, uh, we had some publications done on this as a part of this ACAR project. If you want to get some more information, please refer to uh, the publications or get in touch with me or my colleagues, and we'll be happy to discuss. With that, I'd like to conclude the presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
Thank you, Karen. That was fascinating. A huge amount of work. Finally coming to a conclusion. That's really, really interesting to see. Um, anyone online, please feel free to type in the questions in the chat or in the um, Q&A box. Um, do we happen to have any questions in the audience? I'll start off. I have yeah. one. Um, please forgive my ignorance um, as I'm learning a lot about the um, spoil piles and also uh, my enclosure, to be honest. So what constitutes success in terms of successful um, rehabilitation of coal spoil piles? So you had a photo um, earlier on uh, taken from from a rehabilitated spoil pile and, and showing um, sort of spoil piles in the distance. Um, so like what, what is a successful rehabilitation? And that's just, yeah, I understand it's a very basic question, but um, just please paint a picture. Yeah, I know that's, that's a really good question. So I'll, 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 I'll speak to that uh, successful, uh, closure in regards to salinity and geochemistry. Mm -hmm. So as a as a part of, I mean, successful closure would be, number one is to just get an understanding of what materials are, uh, how would they behave with time and how much, uh, how much uh, salt loads are they gonna emit, uh, release onto the mine site or and into the surrounding uh, throughout the, uh, throughout mining end of mining and then after closing up uh after the operation ends so uh to get an understanding of that that's that's number one uh step uh we just need to get an idea of how, when would the salts just uh have a quasi uh, a rate that we know that this is just gonna be stable now going further so uh that's what we were trying to do uh to get an understanding that okay uh, we'll model this and then based on the models this tells us it might the salts would take from a the salts from a particular mine from a particular spoil dump would take uh 200 300 400 500 years to decay so that's that's what uh the the focus was to get just first an understanding of when would this decay and then um, closure has a lot of other perspectives management of the materials so uh that's a different thing uh if you how you want to manage your spoil dumps uh first uh, rehabilitation so rehabilitation uh the photos that i was referring to was from rehabilitated spoil but rehabilitated spoils would stop erosion and would stop uh would stop uh the uh, would 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 help uh the water seep through the materials and then uh it's gonna release less salts compared to the fresh materials because fresh wood, fresh materials would uh, react with oxygen uh, and just oxygen would might be seeping in uh, through those spoiled dumps that are not yet uh, stabilized, uh, finalized, uh, and I would put in finalized land pumps. So yeah, so that's, that's pretty, uh, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, first, just to get an idea of the scale of the issue and then uh, closure would, uh, assist with how we tackle them if there's an issue and how long it, it's going to take to uh, to be a, a stable land farm. So, yeah, I'm sorry, not a direct answer, but that's, yeah. No, it is a very direct uh, answer, and um, you did succeed in painting a picture. I didn't realize how long it takes. So, that's fascinating. We do have some questions uh, from the online audience. Um, would you please put up the slide of references again? And uh, thank you for an interesting talk. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, that should be up now. Um, another audience member is saying, an amazing presentation. I want to ask about the potential of the salt, uh, in brackets, secondary minerals like gyrocide, et cetera, to release heavy metals to the environment. Uh, yeah, so that's 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 highly likely. Uh, uh, so, from my experience, um, 
uh, what what we found out is uh, the mineralogy is very important uh, in release of the secondary minerals and uh, uh, so, so soils from the secondary um, uh, minerals. Uh, and what I, I, I what I see is uh, getting a thorough understanding of from from waste characterization of those materials, as uh, for example. Even before uh, you're mining, you're getting the uh, drilling done just to get an understanding of the waste characterization. You get the samples in, uh, you 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 select some samples based on their characteristics, and they go through uh, quantitative XRD, and then you identify uh, the materials that are gonna release uh, salts uh, that 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 are gonna be problematic in releasing salts, and then uh, there's highly uh, chances of uh, materials such as jerocide uh, to play a key role in the release of salts, and um, and 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 then. Uh, you know where the material is being placed uh, uh, after uh, mining, uh, where that material is going, and then uh, you design design uh, design a treatment, uh, a, a, a design your sp a spoil dump in a way where the materials uh, uh, dumped within the uh, is dumped in a way that it's not getting oxidized is uh, the pyrites not getting oxidized uh, some sulfatic minerals are not getting exposed to oxygen and then uh, and then you uh, you have more uh, neutralizing capacity materials around it uh, so that uh, so that uh, it it uh, and then you have clay minerals uh, uh, a, a layer of clay minerals that would uh, that would block the moment of water seeping through that dump. So, 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 yeah. So that's 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 what goes into uh, uh, the selective handling of materials, and then that goes into how we plan on understanding what sort of minerals would behave under field conditions and how do we manage it. So, so that's yeah. That's 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 what I see from that perspective of salt release. Excellent. Um, so by answering this question, you sort of almost answered uh, one of the other questions. And um, the question was, do you think we can move towards modeling based on hard rock characteristics and using like MLA and CAMSCAN techniques and comminution tests without leaching experiments for earlier stages of exploration or advanced exploration? Uh, can I have it again? I'm sorry. Um, so just the last part of that question. Oh, um, so using hard rock characteristics and comminution tests uh, without the leaching experiments, and and this way you can you can um, apply this knowledge at an earlier stage. So like during the earlier stages of uh, even before the mine becomes a mine. You know what I mean? Um, so I like during exploration drilling. For example, yeah. and just yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not 100% aware of the combination test uh, and hydrostatic uh, test. Uh, uh, so I I I might not be able to address that question, but um, uh, I think uh, so. Once the material is being taken out, you do this static test uh, first, just to get an understanding of that material, and then uh, in order to uh, in order to model, you have to have an understanding of those leaching rates of different salt ions that's being released from that material. And, and that's why we use this kinetic test. We rely on this kinetic test because that tells us that this is the material and this is the maximum salt load that's going to come out of this uh, under the harsh harsh conditions the uh, the very stringent conditions and 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 then you so that's the worst case scenario and then you try to uh uh model them based on individual ions uh, uh, uh the decay rates of individual ions so that's 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 the purpose of kinetic leaching experiments uh uh so yep, I would wind up on that, uh, but I'll definitely have a chat about that and look into something if we can do before uh, mining uh, during the exploration stages. Excellent. We have one more question. It appears you're focused on dumps during production. Can you comment on salt laws from rehabilitated dumps with a cover system? That is, 
growth media, uh, approximately one meter, with plants using water in the 600 millimeter rainfall environment versus 1.5 meters of pan evaporation. Would you expect infiltration of leach water at all? Very specific question. Yeah. Uh, I, I Yes, I would expect infiltration of leach water, uh, but the, the growth media would definitely have an impact on the release, the, seep, the leaching of salts from the spoil dumps. Very good. I think this is it, unless there is an audio. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I did learn a lot in particular because I'm standing quite far from this area. And because of that, my question is gonna be also really basic and probably easy, but we all used to hear about acid mine drainage and we know why it's so tremendous for the environment. What about salinity drainage? What it actually causes? What are the um, uh, consequences of it? Why do we care about that much? And what is the potential of high volume of salinity drainage? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And that was the heart of this presentation. Uh, actually, uh, traditionally, uh, so uh, traditionally, uh, all the work that has been done uh, in order to understand the, uh, the materials uh, is in from the perspective of acid mine drainage. So you do the acid base accounting on the materials to get an understanding of the total sulfur and what minerals such as pyrite are going to be impacting the release of salts, uh, sorry, uh, the release of contaminants. And then, uh, and, and, and that's, that's, that's a really key issue uh, uh, in, 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 in many parts of the world, acid mine drainage. But uh, Queensland is, uh, is unique uh, with its landmass, uh, just has a lot of salts. Uh, and, and the salts are, uh, are occurring naturally through sedimentary environment. And, and, and then uh, there's also a role of marine environment uh, within uh, that, that had a key role to play. Uh, uh, and, and what happened is the seawater uh, that came through the landmass, uh, which evaporated and then left a lot of salts within the landmass, and, uh, and, and then the coal seam formations took place. So, so that's why Queensland has a unique issue with uh, salinity. And that's why we're focusing, when we're focusing, working on Queensland coal mines, a lot of mines don't have uh, significant. I mean, there are pockets of pyrite, sulfidic minerals, but uh, uh, besides that, uh, uh, there's less uh, issues of acid mine drainage. It's more salinity. So that's why we were um, we are focusing on uh, understanding what's 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 how much salinity is going to impact our uh, receiving environments, and uh, how do we predict them at first, like. Uh, uh, certain mine sites have conditions that they can release water outside their mine leaves, for example. And what what what's happening right now is the mine site is the is just accumulating salts because water is getting evaporated and then salts are moving up due to evaporation and then it's just uh, building up a lot of salts with time and then you have this uh, major rainfall event at some point and then it's going to release a lot of salt at once. So. That's 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 kind of issues uh, are uh, are are the reason we are doing this research and yeah so uh, and yeah so I would say that salinity is the number one issues on uh, uh, mine sites in Queensland in Bowen Basin and yeah yeah um, just out of curiosity what about Surat Basin. Uh, uh, I didn't had a chance to understand and work on the Surat Basin, uh, and then I we had a we we focused more on uh, open cut coal mines and okay. Bowen Basin's the heart of open cut coal mines uh, in Queensland. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry, I won't be able to comment on Surat oh. Basin. Yeah, thinking out loud. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is great. Thank you so much for a very um, very stimulating discussion. And thanks everyone for tuning in online and for the audience today.
Um, next week, we coincidentally have another presentation sort of continuing talking about uh, mind closure. And we've got um, SMI's own Ben Seligman presenting on optimizing mind closure by applying the causal network topology analysis. Please join us then. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Karen. Thank you.